All right, are there any questions? Any questions? So then we'll take off from where we left last time, right? I was on the last page of this COD explain uh, handout or, you know, explanatory material. I was on this page, right? And we had gone ahead and derived this uh, analytical expression for the COD. In the case where you're doing linear prediction of, of one uh, random variable uh, using the other one, right? Uh, now, <clears throat> I also want to co cover a special case, right? If you have uh, two random variables that are jointly Gaussian, right, then special things are going to happen, right? So if we employ only the correlation coefficient, rho y x, between the two normal random variables x and y, then our understanding concerns the prediction of y from x. So you'll observe one of the random variables, you want to make a, an estimate of the other one, and you're going to use a linear formula of the form y hat equals a hat x plus b hat, right? So when the two random variables are jointly Gaussian, right, the conditional density function also is, is Gaussian, right? And in this case, actually, the, the conditional mean, right, uh, is given by a linear expression, right? So if it happens that x and y are jointly Gaussian, then the best predictor is linear, and its error is given by this expression, and the expression for the COD is, the COD is equal to the squ square of the correlation coefficient, right? So how do you show that? And again, this is something, I mean, all of you have taken undergrad, uh, undergrad courses in random processes and probability and so on. You know, this is just an exercise in that. So if you have two random variables, x and y, that are jointly normal with correlation coefficient rho, then we know that the joint density is going to be given by an expression of this form, right? Rho is the correlation coefficient. Mu x is the mean of x. Uh, mu y is the mean of y, right? This is the expression, right? Now, in this case, the marginal random variables, x and y, are also normally distributed, right? Because if you integrate, about, uh, int integrate out over y, then you're going to get the, uh, the, the marginal density for x, okay? That is also normally distributed. And uh, they have means mu x and mu y, and variances sigma square x and sigma square y. So the density function for x is given by the following expression, right? Oops. So the density function, if you integrate this out over y, you will get this density function, okay, which is that for a univariate normal, right? Now, to get the conditional density function, because remember, the best minimum mean square error estimate is the conditional mean, right? So if you have the conditional density, you can calculate the conditional mean from that. So to get the conditional density function, you're going to divide the joint density by the marginal density, right? And you get this expression. Well, this also looks like a normal, uh, looks like the probability density function of a normal random variable, right? Where the mean in this case is basically whatever is sitting here, right, mu x whatever, mu y plus rho sigma x over sigma, uh, sigma y over sigma x times x minus mu x, right? That is the expression for the conditional mean, right? So, uh, so the conditional density is a univariate normal with mean equal to this, and the variance will be the square of this quantity in the denominator, right? So variance is equal to that, sigma square y, one minus rho square. So for two jointly normal random variables, the conditional mean is a linear function of x, right? Because I sh the expression that we had over there, right? You can see that the conditional mean, see the, co the conditional mean, mean of y given x, right? Is basically a linear function of x. x appears linear in here, okay? So in this case, the best predictor, right? Or the optimal predictor is actually a linear predictor. So if you look within the class of linear predictors, you are not giving up anything. Linear predictors or linear estimators. And we can actually calculate the COD. So for two jointly normal random variables, the conditional mean is a linear function of x. All right, that is the optimal mean square estimator is linear. And furthermore, if you look at the, the error of that optimal uh, mean square estimator, that is given by this variance that you have here, sigma square y, one minus rho square. And therefore, the epsilon opt, in the COD definition, you had epsilon dot minus epsilon opt over something, all right? So epsilon opt is given by this, sigma square y, y one minus rho square, right? So since in the absence of any data, in the absence of any information on x, all right, the, uh, the, the best estimate is the mean of y, all right? And the error of the mean of y is basically the variance, all right? 
So you can plug that into the COD definition and you can calculate that the, the, the COD, right, for the optimal predictor, which is, a, which is also the COD of the best linear predictor, is going to be given by epsilon dot, that's sigma square y, minus epsilon op that you calculated, divided by sigma square y, and that's equal to rho square, okay, which is basically the square of the correlation, right? So in this case, we are able to get a closed form expression, right, and we actually have the best uh, predictor also, uh, you know, well within our reach because the conditional density in this case is, is uh, Gaussian, right, and we can get it, derive it quite easily, okay? So this is also going to be used in the paper that I'm going to discuss today. Right? So that's why we discussed all these extra things like asides, okay, so that we can, uh, when we are going through the paper, we are not going to have to stop and explain all this stuff. So are there any questions on this material? Okay, if there are no questions, right, then we are now ready to actually go ahead and discuss the COD paper, right? So this is, uh, and I believe you already have a PDF file of this paper, right? So this, this paper is basically concerned with the uh, general nonlinear framework for the analysis of gene interaction via multivariate expression arrays, okay? So here you have looked at gene expressions across different conditions, and you're trying to find out relationships between genes, okay? Which gene is related to, to, an, to, the, uh, to another gene, to a particular gene? So if you have a target, which are the best predictors for that target, okay? And then you have a choice here, because you might have 10,000 genes on the microarray, all right? So if you pick one target, you have those other 9,999 genes, okay? that are potential predictors, okay? So you can get all kinds of combinations, right? I mean, you have 9,999, you could say that, okay, any two genes will predict that gene, okay? Three genes, okay? So there are lots of different combinations that you can, can try out, you know? And if you want to exhaustively evaluate all these different com combinations, you know, it's going to be a lot of, of, of computational effort, right? But typically they do it with two or three of them, right? So the idea here is, how are you going to pick up the best predictor? You're going to say that, you know, the set which gives you the, the highest COD, right, the COD close to one, that will be the good predictor for, for that gene, okay? So you're trying to find out, by looking at gene expression data, you're trying to figure out relationships between genes, okay? That's the main idea here, okay? So this is prediction, right? So you observe the expression of some random variables, all right? Based on that, you want to make a guess about the expression of some other random variables. And usually the quantization will be binary, like zero, one. So this is very much like a classification problem, all right? Except that the feature vector is what you observe, all right? Feature vector is what you observe, and then based on that, you're going to spit out a class label, all right? Either zero or one, or one, zero minus one, okay? That's what this, uh, this particular uh, paper talks about, okay? It tries to develop the machinery for that, okay? And I will go through it slowly, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that you'll be following most of it, all right? So, so for the CDNA microarray, I don't need to explain anything because we have already covered that in detail, all right? So all this stuff is basically about the biology, about transcripts, how the microarrays are done and all that stuff. But now at the end of the day, you basically have a microarray slides with a bunch of ones and zeros, one, zero, and minus one, okay, if it is ternary quantization. And you want to use that information, right, to come up with the predictors for a particular gene, right? If you, you want to be able to predict the expression at spot number 10 based on expressions at spot number seven and spot number nine, okay? And you do not know a priori what, uh, which genes to use as your predictors, right? So that's the problem that they're trying to address here. Okay, so here is this diagram, right? So based on your measurements of X, all right? So these could be some of the genes on the microarray. You're trying to make a prediction for this variable Y, okay? Y is some function of all these variables that are going in and some others, okay? There are latent variables, but I want to use the data that I have, all right? Like expression of X versus Y, the data that's given to me to come up with a predictor, right? Now, what is the form of this predictor? It could be a very, very complicated function that you come up with. Then you're going to need tons of data to infer the, uh, that particular predictor, right? On the other hand, you might make simplifying assumptions. Like you might say it'll be a linear predictor, something maybe with a linear predictor and some slight nonlinearity, right? The, the, the cho choice is yours, all right? So this paper basically deals with nonlinear multivariate prediction, and it is in a setting where you have like uh, ternary data, okay? Because in the microarray, we have already seen you have the red channel, green channel, right? Red over green is almost one, right? The ratio. It's significantly higher than one, significantly less than one, okay? So there are three possibilities, and we will denote those by one, zero, minus one, right? So you want to come up with that kind of function, right? So that kind of function, right, 
can be represented. So you can either represent it using an expression, right? Or you can represent it by just some measurements that you have taken, right? So, uh, I mean, like, like uh, if, if you're trying to represent a function, you can either provide a closed form expression, right? Or you can provide values, right? The values of x and f of x, that'll also define the function. So here, if you're looking, for example, here you, you're looking, let's say, for the most general nonlinear, and if there is a question anywhere, just stop me, okay? I'm gonna try to help you to read the paper on your own, right? Hopefully you'll do that, right? But again, I mean, if you have any questions, just stop me, right? And, and we'll explain. But I think I have covered a lot of the preliminary material uh, in the last lecture and what I, what I covered uh, using that PDF file just leading up to this paper. So the most general nonlinear predictor or filter for discrete data can be represented by a logic table, all right? Because here everything is discretized. So for ternary data, you have three possible levels for each variable, minus one, zero, plus one. The table is going to have a row for each input variable, like x1, x2 here, all right? All the different possibilities, all right? Minus one, zero, and one, all right? And then, and one for the output variable, all right? So if there are m variables, right, because here it is ternary, right, if there are m variables, then you are going to have 3 to the power of m columns, because there will be 3 to the power of m possible combinations that you will get using these variables, right, and, uh, and there will be m plus 1 rows, because 1 row corresponding to each variable, and then the final row for the output, okay, that you are predicting, all right. Now, there are many ways to represent, uh, mathematically represent nonlinear predictors, including via logic circuitry. So the basic task here is to design nonlinear predictors from the data, right? Quantitatively, the problem is straightforward. The theoretically optimal predictor of the target Y based on the predictor variables X1 to Xm is unknown and must be statistically estimated, right? And the theoretically optimal predictor has minimum error across the population and must be designed, estimated from a sample by some training uh, or estimation method. Now the degree to which a design predictor approximates the optimal predictor depends on the training procedure and the sample size. Okay, we know that if you have small sample size, you're not going to be able to get good estimates, all right? So even for a relatively small number of predictor genes, precise design of the optimal predictor requires a large number of experimental applications. We have talked about this. Even in classification, you have the same problem, okay? And prediction is no different than classification, right? So. We will go back to that picture that we had before, right? I think that's the picture that is coming up, all right? So it's not something new, right? See here, just like we had in classification, we had the Bayes error here, right? The error of the optimal predictor without imposing any structural constraints, right? The best predictor over all classes, you know, is this one. Let's say that's the error. Now, the problem is you are going to have to design the predictor from the data, okay? Nobody's going to give you the probability distributions and all that. So if you design from the data, then it's basically a random variable, okay, because it depends on the sample. So you have to look at the expectation. Well, the expect, expected value of the error is going to approach the error of the optimal predictor, right? Optimal nonlinear predictor as the sample size goes to infinity. But for small sample sizes, you have a problem, okay? There's a big, big mismatch here. So what do you do? You put some constraints on the, on the, uh, on the predictor. You might say, I'm going to use only a linear predictor, right? Okay, in the process, you have you know, up the error for the optimal design because, you know, the optimal linear predictor obviously will have a higher error than the, the optimal predictor without any, any constraints, okay, on the class, all right? You have up that, but the linear predictor is much e easier to estimate, okay? So especially with smaller samples, the difference between the error that you make in trying to estimate this constrained uh, predictor, right, and, and the error of the, uh, of the optimal predictor, that'll be a lot smaller, okay? So if you're operating in this region, which is going to be typically the case when you're working with microarrays, you will work with constraint predictors, okay? It might be linear or maybe linear with some nonlinearity put on it. You're not going to just look over a general class of nonlinear predictors. You're not going to work with that table, with that table for ternary data that I showed you because that has got too many possibilities and you don't have enough data to infer all the entries in that table. So here, all this stuff, all right? All this stuff here is exactly the same kind of discussion that we had for classification, right? If you remember why we put constraints and then you looked at that curve and all that stuff, exactly the same kind of discussion, right? And then, 
So having gone through that discussion, we decide that, okay, we are going to put some structure on the predictor. We're not going to say it's a structureless predictor because we don't have enough data to infer it, okay? So what is the structure that you're going to choose, right? So figure two, which we just already skipped, I think figure two, figure two is the next one, okay? The, I think that's the design, uh, the, the, the problem that we discussed, the design problem, okay? And uh, so the class of predictors that we are going to pick, right, they are made up of what are called perceptrons, okay, which is basically you take a linear combination of the data, right, like you have X, these variables you're observing. These could be genes on the microarray, A1, X1 plus A2, X2 up to AM, XM plus B, right? And then you put it through some thresholding function, okay? Because you, you have three classes here, one, zero, minus one, okay? If this thing is great, if this argument is greater than zero, it'll split out one. If it is uh, uh, le uh, less than zero, it'll, it'll split, out, split out zero, right? Alternatively, you could have ternary perceptron where you'll say that this is going to split out one if uh, this quantity is, uh, I think, greater than 0.5, it'll spit out minus one if this quantity, this argument is less than minus 0.5, right? And in between, it'll, it'll spit out zero, okay? Now, in the process, you have really decreased the number of variables because in order to specify this predictor, this function, you know, this is a thresholding function. All you need are the coefficients, a1, a2, up to am, right, and b, okay? Whereas in the other, other table that I gave you earlier, you have many more variables to fill up, okay? A lot, lot more stuff to learn from the data. Okay. So here he does some calculations. There are three to the power of nine possible two variable ternary nonlinear predictors from that table, right? But here the number is only 417, right? So I, and I, I haven't gone through the calculation leading to that 417, but it's obviously a lot smaller than three to the power of nine. Okay, you can check that. And uh, the design of the perceptron will require estimating these coefficients A1 through AM and then B, right? And um, uh, in the appendix, he provides an algorithm for a training algorithm, an update algorithm for uh, estimating these parameters. Now, one way of constraining predictors which are less constrained than perceptrons is to use neural networks, all right? So uh, here, it's just one linear function and then, uh, then one nonlinearity, okay? In a neural network, you'll have multiple layers, multiple linear combinations going in through one nonlinearity, then again another linear com set of linear combinations going in through another nonlinearity and so on, okay? So you can use that, but again, I mean, uh, you'll have more flexibility, but you're going to need more data, okay? Because if you make your predictive function more complicated, you're going to need more data to learn it. And data, at least in cancer genomics, is very, very uh, scarce, right? So this is the discussion about the two-layer neural network. You have a linear combination of the weights going through one nonlinearity, then again a linear combination of this thing going through another nonlinearity, and you can have many layers, okay? Now, uh, do you know why neural networks are so popular, or anybody? They're good for classifiers. Huh, what? They're good for classifiers. They... Uh, are, they, are they good classifiers? Not necessarily. Like, if you don't have enough data, you won't get a good classifier, right? No. Well, I mean, one of the reasons I think they're so popular is that there's not really a very good theory for them, okay? So anybody can use them, okay? I use my, run my neural net, okay? But what the neural net is in reality is it is basically a function approximator, right? Some guy has shown, okay, guy or gal, okay, whoever it is, many years ago that, you know, any function, right, can be approximated. I think a continuous function on a co compact set, it can be approximated to, uh, any degree of accuracy, right, by using a neural network with sufficient number of neurons, okay? Right, so, but you, you have to, so, if you're trying to approximate some function that you don't know, right, you can probably use a neural network, you know, it'll have enough flexibility that if you choose the weights right, it will approximate that function, okay? So that's where the interest is, but the, the thing is, you have to know those weights, okay? If you use a very complicated function, right, then, and you don't have enough data, right? You use too complicated a function, then it'll be an overfitting problem, right? No, no, you no, know, there are heuristics, okay, but uh, again, I mean, like, like uh, you know, uh, it'll go to local minima, okay, you don't have global minima, right, you have local minima. Now, if you want to look at the basis for that stuff, one of the things that is used in neural, neural network steering is called the backpropagation algorithm. That is basically the gradient descent, okay, and if you want to really learn about that area, you have to look at the area of adaptive control, adaptive systems, uh, uh, adaptive identification and control, because in that area, 
you know it's not for a nonlinear system okay but all these techniques are developed with provable guarantees of convergence stability robustness and so on okay here nothing can be uh, because uh, the cost function is not convex okay so there is a problem so you don't have uh, a global minimum you have local minima right and you really cannot you can get only local type results okay but it, again it's fertile ground because in adaptive control all those problems are solved okay so people are out of business okay there's no work here you, there's nothing is done so you can you know tweak things around run more simulations and do it you know? so that's the advantage okay and uh, anybody can do that you know and if you if you tell somebody that you're going to do uh, something using let's say linear systems you're not going to get any money right but if you do with neural networks or intelligent stuff you know really you're doing nothing you're just tinkering around but you would get money over there okay so simply because it's not a close and and there are people who have even done with fuzzy systems all right those are also universal approximators all right so there are people that have done that you know and you know why would i use a neural network or a fuzzy system? i could use a polynomial you know but the problem is if i use polynomial or or cubic spline nobody's going to give me money because that's already they worked out in the math literature all right so but anyway that was just an aside discussion you know i'm not trying to you know downgrade anybody or you know insult anybody you know but that's the state of the art but anyway this is a neural network and here there is a diagram that is showing you how uh, you know you could use a neural network to approximate a function right see here he says that a key problem with using neural networks for microarray prediction is that multilayer stochastic training can be very imprecise when data sets are li limited and in this paper we restrict ourselves to unconstrained perceptron predictors see because here if you're doing linear system identification you need sufficient frequencies in the input signal right in order to be able to identify your parameters right like if you're doing for example if a system if you're doing like frequency response right you have magnitude and phase from two bits of information you can identify two parameters so for every frequency you'll get a magnitude phase so you will need really for a linear system it has been shown in the adaptive literature that if you have n parameters you need n over 2 uh, di distinct frequencies so that you have n spectral what are called n spectral lines okay and there is, i'm not advertising for my course but there is a course on adaptive control that i do teach you know once in a while and we cover some of those things okay but in the in this because it's non linear right See, if it's a linear system, a linear system is not going to produce any new, new frequencies. You excite a linear system with a sine wave, it is going to produce a sine wave with an amplitude change, all right, and a phase shift, all right. In a nonlinear system, you do the Fourier analysis, it's going to produce a whole bunch of different frequencies, okay. So nailing things down, you know, like what is it going to take, okay, how many frequencies are you going to need to get the parameters to converge is a different story, all right. But it's a fertile area because if if nothing can be proven theoretically, means people are not going to be out of work. Okay, you can just get a new application and run this, and and uh, you know you 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 have a research problem. Right? Okay, so now to get back to our stuff. So so the, so this is a question of how you're going to uh, you know what kind of structure you're going to use for the predictor. In this paper, they're using a perceptron. Somebody wants to, they can use neural network. They can use whatever else they like. Right? But at the end of the day, you want to do you want to find out the coefficient of determination right which will help you to um, you know figure out association between genes okay so so let's take a look at this so if y is a real valued random variable and uh, let's say the error that you're using is the mean square error right then the expected value of uh, y predicted minus y absolute value square right so so the mean square error is the criterion that you're using then the best predictor of y in the absence of any observations is its mean. Okay, we know that. I already proved that in, in, in the last uh, lecture, right? And the error of that best predictor in the absence of any observations is basically the variance, right? I showed that to you. Now, the best unconstrained predictor of y based on the observed real val valued variables is the conditional expectation of y. I showed that to you too, right? Given these observed variables, right? So there is no general moment expression for the conditional expectation, right? In general, you don't have that, okay? You need to know the conditional density and then you have to calculate from there. However, there is one for the best linear predictor, right? And this is something that I derived last time. That's why I did all those derivations, okay? So its form is that of equation two, absent the threshold, right? Where equation two was basically that linear combination, I think, without the... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's basically this, you know. If it's linear, then you won't have the thresholding function. The thresholding is going to make it nonlinear. Okay, so the optimal coefficients are determined by the vector equation A equals R pseudo inverse C, 
all right? Where R is the autocorrelation matrix for the random vector V, and C is the cross-correlation uh, vector for Y and V, and R plus is the pseudo-inverse. Okay, I derived this, all right, last time. If you look back in your notes, all right? All that is derived all, when I talked about the orthogonality principle and all that. So for digital pr processing, all predictors, including the conditional expectation and the optimal linear predictor must be quantized if you're going to do digital, all right? Not analog. Now the coefficient of determination of the optimal predictor is the relative decrease in error due to the presence of the observed vari variables, right? So you, so you want to see, okay, what is the error of the best predictor without any observations, all right? Then you make the observations, all right? Am I doing any better, all right? In the presence of the observations, of, excuse me, I, de I designed the best predictor, all right? Is that any better than what I was doing before, all right? If not, then I might as well not make any observations, okay? Not talk about any relationships between what is observed and what, what you're trying to estimate, all right? So this is so that so this is the basis of the formula for the COD that I already talked about, right? When we went through the PowerPoint slides. So theta opt is epsilon dot minus epsilon opt over epsilon dot, where epsilon dot is the error for the best predictor in the absence of observations. Okay, that would be the error associated with the mean, which would be the variance, all right? And and in general, this will be a number between zero and one, because hopefully, when you have made observations, you're not doing any worse, all right? You're doing a little bit better, so you know if with uh, observations, your error goes to zero, then you'll have a COD of one. If uh, with observations, your error doesn't reduce, it's still epsilon dot, you'll get a COD of zero, right? So that's the idea. So in statistics, and uh, you know, many of you here have very strong background in statistics, and the coefficient of determination has been used to evaluate the significance of uh, multiple linear regression, right? So you, you must be familiar with that, okay? And it has been recently used in nonlinear digital signal processing. Now for linear predictors, you can get a closed form expression, which is what I, what I showed you at the beginning of this class, right? For linear prediction using the mean square error, the coefficient of determination can be analytically expressed in terms of second order moments of the observations and the target, right? And I derived this expression, right? It's there in the note, additional notes that I gave you, where rho is the correlation coefficient and if we only, uh, if we employ only the correlation coefficient between two variables, all right, then we can see that the COD actually works out to being the square of the correlation coefficient, right? That's what I did at the beginning of this class, sorry. Now for most nonlinear predictors, right, you're not going to be able to do that, okay? You cannot get close from expressions. So including perceptrons, which is what we are going to use, there is no moment expression such as equation five for the coefficient of determination. And for the unconstrained ternary pr predictor, theta opt will be given by this expression, right? Where, uh, you know, this is the error when, uh, when you're predicting y using its mean, right? Okay, so y, uh, actually it's uh, y using uh, the thresholding function applied to the mean, okay? Because here you have a perceptron, so you have this linear thing, and then that is passing through a thresholding function, right? So that is epsilon mu, and then this is the, error that you get from the predictor that you uh, come up with, right, using all the data, right. Now, if you're going to do, if you're going to get this, uh, the COD in, in the case of constrained prediction, right, then this will be re replaced by epsilon opt constraint, okay, that's what is being done here. Right. All right, any questions? Now, the problem is that, you know, I don't know these these guys, okay? Because this this business of predicting y by uh, you know the threshold applied to the mean of y, okay? I don't have the mean of y, right? So I have to find the mean of y, okay? So I have to learn everything from the data, right? So now this becomes basically a design problem, right? Because if, if it's a textbook problem, you'll give me the probabilities I can go and do the calculation, like some of the ones that you have done on on homework number two, where you did Bayesian classification and all that. But in the real world, you're not going to have that information. Right, so you have to learn from the data, right? And then, you know, obviously the expect expectation of this one is going to be larger than the, the than uh, or or the error is going to be larger than what you would get, right? Than than the performance of the best possible predictor, okay? And so, so in that case, you know that for small sample sizes, right, you're going to be way off, right? So you have to put constraints, or you have to do some kind of constraint prediction, right? Maybe using a perceptron or something like that, okay? And this is again that same discussion, right? The same discussion about, you know, what the effect of the constraint would be on the, on the coefficient of determination. And the idea here is given a particular target gene, right? 
I can come up and let's say I, I decide that I'm going to use only two genes to predict it, okay? I will look over all these expressions on the microarray and figure out, okay? For each of them, I will try to figure out which, which set of two genes is going to give me the smallest error, the predict or which set of two genes is going to allow me to reduce the error the most, right? And, and based on that, you know, I will calculate the COD. So the ones which have high CODs, those are the good ones, okay? So you want to, and, and th this method is basically a statistical method. There's no cause and effect here. You just look at the numbers, and based on that, you make predictions about which genes are likely to be related to which ones, okay? And uh, uh, this was done in, I mean, there was uh, data, experimental data that went into this paper. I'll talk about this in a few minutes. And, and for that, uh, you know, in that data, the biologists actually threw in a couple of fictitious genes also. Like, you know, some, some fictitious gene is, let's say, um, some function of the other other predictors, okay? And they wanted to see whether this method could pick it up, okay? And it did, okay? It did pick up those associations, as, as I'm going to point out in a few minutes, right? So, all right, any questions? Now, here, see, the problem is you want to design the, the predictor, okay? The best predictor, you also, in order to calculate the COD, you need an estimate of the error of the best predictor because it's the error, okay? The error of the best predictor minus the error of the best predictor when you have observations divided. So, so you need to be able to calculate those errors, okay? How are you going to do that? Well, you need to do error estimation, okay? Same kind of methods that you use in classification like resubstitution, right, cross-validation, bootstrap, whatever, you know? Same thing, then nobody's telling you which one to use because there are no theoretical guarantees anywhere, okay? So you're going to use one of those methods and get your error estimates, and then you will calculate the COD from that. Okay. So there is quite a lot of theory that goes into, into this stuff, and you know, some of that is in the appendix. But we are going to move on to the, the actual example. Right. So this, is, uh, this talks about cross-validation, right? resubstitution. Right? So which one you should use? Then there is the issue of feature selection. selection okay? How many predictors are you going to use? Right, if you use too many predictors, again, you'll have problems, okay, because you don't have enough data to learn, right? So the feature selection problem is haunting you again, right? But let's say those have been figured out, you decided you're going to use two or three predictors, and you ran your algorithm, your software, right? And you came up with the CODs, okay? Then now based on the CODs, you would be able to, you know, figure out the association between different genes, even use this information to come up with regulatory networks and so on. Okay, again, cause-effect relationship not captured here. Only associations captured, all right? So let's uh, move on to the biological example, all right? So again, I mean, if you like this kind of math or, you, or you're really interested in this, read the whole paper in its entirety because it has the math and all that worked out at the end, all right? And it might refer you to some other papers. Sorry. And another thing I should point out is that you know, this paper was published in 2000, okay? Let me show you, okay. Look, these guys, okay? This is Joe Dirichi, all right? And he's out of, uh, let's see, Pat Brown's group from Stanford. They were the first ones that did the microarrays, right? Okay? In 1996. See, Joe Dirichi, Pat Brown. So he was, I, I think this guy has moved to UD Austin, you know, I'm not sure, but he, he probably did, okay? But he, has he? Okay. But I'm saying that he was a postdoc in this lab. And see, these, these are publications in nature genetics and science, okay? Because they were the first ones that did the microarrays. Now, that paper, the, the one that we discussed, the ratio analysis paper, that is also one of the first papers on microarrays, okay? And I believe Mike Bittner is probably on one of these, okay? See, you guys will feel good. You came to the right place, see? Mike Bittner is here, right? So, you know, he's been associated with these things since the early days of the microarrays, right? And that ratio uh, analysis, so these are the two of the first papers on microarrays, and the third one is the first paper on image analysis of microarrays. That's the paper that we already discussed. Right? So anyway, going back to our discussion, right? See, this is, uh, they use stress response data, right? So tests of the ability of both the full logic, that is unconstrained predictor and the perceptron to detect associations based on changes in transcriptional level have been performed in the context of responsiveness to genotoxic stress, right? As a result of a microarray study surveying transcription of 1,238 genes during the response of a myeloid line to ionizing radiation, 
30 genes not previously known to participate in response to ion were found to be responsive. I think this is the other paper that they're referring to. You know, let, let me see. Let me just make sure, okay. Is that right or no? Let's see. 18, okay. So is that, I'm not sure whether it is that or, or something else. Okay, let's look at 18. Oh, no, 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 this is something else. This, this, this paper, all right, 18. Sally and Munson, yeah. So this is about fluorescent cDNA microarray hybridization reveals complexity and heterogeneity of cellular genotoxic stress response. But anyway, they had done the work on this, okay, where they zapped the cells with ionizing radiation and looked at gene expression, right? And that same data they're going to, uh, I mean, in this paper, they figured out that, uh, you know, this kind, running this kind of experiments uh, pointed them in the direction of 30 genes that they didn't know earlier were involved in this kind of response, right? So to, to further characterize the responsiveness of these genes to uh, genotoxic stresses, the responsiveness of a subset of nine of them was examined by blot assays in 12 cell lines, okay? And you guys now know what blots are, okay? The southern blot, western blot, and all that stuff, all right? Uh, by blot assays in 12 cell lines stimulated with ionizing radiation, that's one stressor, a chemical mutagen, right? Or ultraviolet radiation. The cell lines were chosen so that a sampling of both P53 proficient and P53 deficient cells would be assayed. And as a blind control expression patterns for, see, I told you about the two fictitious genes that were created, okay? And they call them aha and oho or something like that, okay? Now, so you do this kind of analysis, okay? I mean, you have this data, then you have the predictor, it's up to you to choose whether it's a perceptron or whatever, but then based on that, you did the error estimation for that and you came up with the COD, okay? And then they have the COD diagrams that they have drawn for various genes, all right? So you can see. So this is the set of cell lines that was used, okay, see? So these are the cell lines, these are the conditions, ionizing radiation, then that methyl, whatever, sulfonate, all right, ionizing radiation and so on, ultraviolet radiation. And again, everything has been quantized to zeros and ones, okay? So this is the data that they had, okay? And uh, these are the genes that they're looking at, right? Uh, BCL3, then that's probably involved in apoptosis. P53 is there, P21 is there, MDM2 is there, okay? So, you know, you've seen some of these genes, at least P21, P53, you wrote about it on the exam, okay? So it's not like, something way out there, it's something you have some, uh, and then these two are the fictitious guys that they made up rules for, okay? Now, looking at this data, can you figure out those relationships? That's the question, all right? So they were able to figure out many of these relationships, all right? And uh, these relationships are represented in these diagrams, all right? Like, see here, if this is the target, if you predict the target using only predictor one, the COD is theta one. If you use both predictor one, predictor two, the COD is theta two. If you use predictor one, predictor two, predictor three, the COD is theta, theta one, okay? So you have several of these diagrams. Like this is the one I presented to you earlier, all right? With P53 and MDM2, all right? So you can see if you just use uh, P53 to predict MDM2, it's 0.473. Then if you, if you use, uh, if, if you use, take P53 as the target, oh, this is the one I discussed earlier. This is the one that was there in my PowerPoint notes. If you just use P21, it's 0.227. Okay, if it's just MD, M2, it's 0.259. Use them together, the COD jumps up to 0.452, right? And this paper has a listing of many of these other CODs. So some of them were known from before. Some of the other ones were discovered okay, in, in, the, in the course of this work. So, in fact, I think it has a, an entire table, see? Like it has all these different COD diagrams, okay? So, and, and you're trying to see what the difference is between uh, the perceptron, okay, if you're using perceptron and the full logic, that means using that table, that ternary table, right? So you can see what the CODs look like, okay, this, this, and, and so on, okay. So many, many cases are covered here, right? And, and here, of course, there is some discussion about, you know, which error estimation you should use, okay? whether you should use resubstitution or cross-validation and so on, okay? And if you're interested, if you're, if you're statistically inclined, you know, I encourage you to go and read that stuff, okay? But from an engineering point of view, it's basically about figuring out relationships between genes, okay? 
which are the best predictors for a particular gene. Okay, if, I'm, if I want to improve my knowledge about the, the expression status of a particular gene looking at some other genes, okay, which are the predictors that I should use? Right. That's the kind of problem that is being answered here. Okay. And it, it is being formulated in the context of uh, nonlinear prediction, okay. using a nonlinear predictor, observing something, and then based on those observations, making a, a, uh, using a nonlinear mapping to basically predict uh, a target that you're interested in. And there was some software also developed, and that will, you know, ca ca uh, you know, basically go ahead and provide some, you know, visual display of which are the highest rank predictors and predictor sets and so on. Yeah. But this paper is quite old; it's a 2000 paper, and I think they have, uh, and these are all the different screens. Like yesterday, uh, Nushin Gafari was doing that uh, next gen seek. Okay, like all kinds of screens. So here also you have that kind of stuff. You know, you can do it. And you can see that, you know, it will become very computationally intensive if you have like thousands of genes, if you have no prior knowledge, okay, and you have to look for predictors from scratch, okay, it's a big, big computational problem, right? I mean, because if it's like 10,000 genes and you're going to choose them two at a time, you have to look at 10,000 choose two combinations. Look at all those errors, all right? Calculate the CODs and then figure out which ones you're going to use, okay? So it's very, very computationally intensive. Uh, on the other hand, if you use prior information, you know which one affects which one, you might be able to stick that in and re cut down on your work. Right. And uh, section six of this paper discusses the statistical considerations. And uh, I guess this is the kind of stuff that uh, Dr. Doherty really likes, right? all, all those the bounds and all that are available in the literature. So again, I mean, if you're taking courses and that, you're going to work on the theoretical aspect, then you might want to take a look and uh, read that stuff over there. And this last, so this is the logic circuitry for the perceptron, right? for the predictor in one of the cases, they've given the logic circuitry. And then the last one is about perceptron training, maybe like back propagation algorithm, right? Something similar to that, right? And you update it and, you know, if the error falls below a certain value, then you say you have converged. So that's the discussion of this paper, right? So are there any questions? So I think I have covered enough material, okay, in that explanatory material that I gave you, so that if somebody is interested, they can go and read the whole paper, right? because all the difficult st steps, I have put those in. in. In fact, I had to work those out myself because my background is not in this area, okay? So trying to read that paper, and I'm not a stochastic person, okay? So all those, you know, minimum mean square estimate and all that, that's not like stuff that I dream about. You know? No, there are equations I can do, like if, when I teach the adaptive control class, I tell them, you know, that don't worry about this, you know, after some time you'll be able to derive it in your sleep, okay? But not, not these, okay? So I had to spend some time uh, learning this, but you can do that, and especially most of you, uh, are, are, you know, have, have pretty strong background in, in statistics, stochastic processes and the like, right? Now, so that finishes our discussion of this paper, right? So next time I'm going to start, get started with the intervention because based on this, okay, based on this kind of data, I have already shown you how you can come up with regulatory network. Not necessarily the true network, okay, but you can definitely take this information, construct a probabilistic Boolean network, right, and then look at the dynamics of the network, right. So the next topic that we want to look at is if you don't like the dynamics that you see, okay, the network has been altered, okay, how do you intervene in the network, okay, what would be a judicious way to try to, you know, intervene in the network to move its state from, from a bad situation like that that's causing cancer and metastasis to something that is like more normal, okay. Or, or induce the, the cancer cell to go and kill itself by, by uh, you know, committing suicide, that is apoptosis, right? So things like that I will talk about, okay? Those are the only things that are remaining, right? Intervention and, and control and so on. Uh, I will get done, I'm reasonably confident that by the end of next week, you know, I will get, be get, uh, getting done with all the uh, material that I have to lecture on, okay? So the presentations could start even as early as maybe even next Friday, okay? I, so, I mean, some of you have asked me, so I think it's time for you to start preparing. And I will give, I will hand out three more homeworks. Okay, one, yeah. So many oh, you, you don't want those? Or? <laughs> okay, no, no, see, it's not to force you. It's, it's not to force you, but I don't want you to, you know, leave the class thinking that you didn't have to do enough work, you know, so. Right, I mean, <laughs> so oh, I learned some value. Again, I mean, we could even make those optional or something like that, you know, that's fine too, right? But, you know, for people who really uh, want to learn the material, uh, or maybe you already, do you already know the material or you don't? Do you learn anything doing the homework so it was just a waste of time or, or it took up too much of your time? No, I'm just asking. A little bit uh, labor intensive. 
Okay. You get the, you get the idea. Understand it first. Maybe one question or an example, but no. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, maybe then what I'll do is, you know, I will uh, give out the homework. So, right, you decide. Okay, how much you want to do, right, and turn it in, right? Well, I mean, I don't know how you, huh? Or oh, you won't turn in anything, huh? <laughs> no, because this is grad students. Yeah, but this is a grad class, okay? People will get only A's and B's, okay? You're not going to get D's and F's, right? So, <laughs> so, I mean, like, uh, no, no, no. What we could do is I will, I will hand out like three more homeworks. So all of them are not that long, okay? The second one is probably the longest, the one you did just now, okay? So it's not. Uh, what you might want to do is maybe we take the best four or something like that, you know, among the homework, sorry. We could do something. We, we'll we see, okay, don't worry, okay, this is a new experiment that I'm, I'm trying this time, okay, because uh, then people will think they got more out of the course, right? So, or you don't agree or I don't know. I I thought so because this, this was an exercise for undergrads, okay? So, I mean, huh? you're not undergrads. No, I mean like... The, So why did you find out from those people or what? Yeah. No, no, but see the, 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 the problem with that is that, you know, the presentation is very heavily weighted, okay? So if you, do, if you don't uh, do a good presentation, right, and then you get a B, right? This has happened in one or two cases, then people are not happy. Right? We will have spent um, more time on presentation, so for, for the whole, like, there are so many similar questions on the whole yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, let me see what we what we can do. But again, I mean, get ready for the presentations, all right? Because they could start as early as I said. So the presentation before Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving? All the presentations? Yeah. I don't know whether we'll all, all of them will get done or not because there are uh, 17 people in the class. So you need six lectures, okay? Even if three people present every day, right? You need six lectures, all right? Do you have to choose the dates that are also, or you are going to assign a day? No, I, I will look at the roster, right? And just go in the alphabetical order, okay? So whoever that is, you know. So, who, who, uh, yeah, yeah, alphabetic by last name. That's what the roster does, right? I'm the first one, yeah. Yeah, so you better get your presentation ready. You know, it, it may not happen until the Monday after next week, but I'm just saying that, have you chosen a paper? <laughs> so uh, then you can talk. I know there are two or three other people that have asked me. Okay, you can probably talk to them and see if they'll do it. Okay, no, because no, I sent an email today to you. Oh, you did. And you sent an email, or I'll, you? I'll, I'll send. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah. we like do some like joint presentation, like two people do the same? Then I give you half the points. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> By, by the way, this is, this, is, this is something from my undergrad days. I think somebody went and asked, you know, because it's like four people doing the lab, so they wanted to submit a joint report, you know. The professor said, okay, I'll just split the points into four. And get, so. <laughs> no, well, I mean, if it's joint, then it'll have to be like two presentations, yeah. yeah. And you have to make sure that, you know, it's clear that both people are doing the work, you know. No, no, it's possible, okay? I mean, like, if it's some real uh, important paper. Now, the qu question that I have for you is, like, uh, on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, okay? Do you guys want to take that off, or do you, or you guys don't, really don't care? Actually, actually uh, I know that we have answered for uh, the final. How about you think this? Is the final? No, no, no. No, no, no. We'll, we, no, we'll get done long before then. Yeah, yeah. The 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 what is the time slot for the final? Do you know what it is? Yeah, that's time for you to get extra sleep. You know, so after you work really hard or something. So, yeah. No, no, no. We, no. See, the time slot for the final is very um, tricky because, you know, it, yeah, and it it might be like the day before the grades are due. Okay, I mean, like, yeah, it can be because these are graduating people. It's like yeah, they have a final on Wednesday and then, you know, Thursday by 6 p.m. they want all the grades, okay? In this class, it's not difficult because it's like 17 people, but, you know, let's not push things off that far, you know, so. But I think we can get started because already three people have mailed me, so at least one lecture is, is covered, okay? I mean, like, 
I'm assuming that, uh, and everybody is here, so they are probably preparing for the uh, for the presentation, right? And again, I mean, if you think that the homework is too much of a burden, we at least had two homeworks that you guys turned in. So I can, you know, get the grader to grade that and uh, use that for the points. My main main intention was I didn't want to have so many points concentrated uh, just on the presentation because, you know, there are people, no matter how hard they try, they may not do a good presentation. Okay? Simply they're not, I mean, they haven't mastered the art of pre pre presenting, right? So then it becomes a little bit difficult for me, okay? I mean, like, so, right? To assign the grade. Just related to the biology, no? Yeah, like more, uh, maybe not related to, uh, I'm just kind of <clears throat> No, no, it can be related to the biology, but it should have some quantitative stuff in okay, it too, yeah, you know. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be our brand of, yeah, it doesn't have to be our brand of quantitative stuff, okay? It can be somebody else's brand, but it cannot be like a, a biology paper, okay, on something, you know, yeah. I mean, it could be, but that wouldn't satisfy the requirement for a double E course. You know, so. Well, uh, we could send you a paper and you can Yeah, and you can like, give us the feedback whether we can choose that paper. Sure, that's fine. That's fair enough. But I think now it is time to start choosing the papers. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't, want, I don't want you to do homework at the expense of this thing, okay? Yeah. I will send it out, then we'll see what to do, okay? I mean, okay. Because I, I'm telling you, like you did the homework on, uh, what was the first homework on? It was on microarray image analysis, all right? Uh, the second homework is on uh, classifier. classifier. I think the third one might be on clustering, all right? The fourth one is on uh, this expression prediction COD. Very simple examples, okay? Like you observe one, zero, minus one. Remember, undergrads have done that before you, okay? And you don't, it might be like three problems in each, huh? I mean, they all no, 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 they did, not, they did not complain because of that. They, remember, they had no presentation. They did not complain because of that, but the problem is they, some of them didn't know 303 knowledge, okay? All this conditional expectation and all this stuff, that threw them off, okay? So, and in some of the problems, like, you know, when you're doing Bayes classification and all that stuff, you know, you have to, you have to know some basic probability stuff, right? They were having trouble over there, okay? That's where the complaint came from. Not, not from this. I mean, if there's no, uh, they're done with two exams and only homeworks are being turned in, it's, it's not something to complain about, you know? Yeah, and they don't have to do a presentation. They're okay. Yeah, we need to do everything. Yeah, we can, we can do everything. Uh, that's because you're PhD students, right? I mean, <laughs> you're expected to walk on water, okay? Because you're supposed to come up with stuff that nobody else can see, all right? Whereas for them, they are just doing routine stuff, you know. That's okay, you don't have to do it in this course, but that's the reason why, uh, you know. Any, any other questions? <laughs> huh? uh, all right, so please turn in the homework number two, all right? <laughs>